There you go. All right. Well, welcome everyone to another great Brisbane Azure user group session. So tonight we've got a super exciting uh, talk by Wayne, um, and I'm really looking forward to that. It's a you know Azure virtual desktop. Um, Wayne's promised me, and I've even had a, had a brief look. He's done everything in um, ARM templates, which is amazing, and it's great to see the adoption of ARM templates. I was blown away, to be honest. Had a chat with Wayne. Absolutely floored me. The use of ARM templates is sensational, best I've ever seen. So that's awesome. That's something to look forward to. But before we get into that, we've got a little bit of a roundup of some of the some of the things that have happened this month. Um, there's a couple of events. And there's a couple of people who are looking to to bring on people skilled up in Azure. So um, I think we'll just get into it. So welcome. Um, and drink of choice is Bladnock Scotch. So uh, there's that too. Uh, July 2021. First of all, big thanks out to our sponsors. So Codify and Microsoft, they've been amazing. Uh, they've they've really stood up over the over the time during COVID, and and they've been here for our group for for many many years, as long as I can remember. Which is not long because I drink a lot, but that's okay. Um, so thank you very much for them, and also for the people who do get involved. You're amazing. This group would not be here without everybody's uh, contribution. So big thank you for everyone who has got involved. Big thank you for the people that are that are preparing their talks coming up, and there's still a couple of spots. So if you if you are looking to get involved, and it doesn't have to be a massive talk, a little talk is fine. Uh, let us know. We're really keen to hear from you. We we don't necessarily want the professionals talking. Um, we want people who've lived the experience. That's that's the most important thing to our group is. What experiences have you had with Azure? It doesn't have to be super polished. It's all about how have you got along, what can you share with the community, and how can you help someone else that's also in the same shoes you are. Um, this is our current schedule. So we've got a bunch of spots. December, hopefully we'll get a, this year, hopefully we'll get a few um, quick short talks in December. Um, and there's a bunch of spots left for people who want to do you know, what have you been getting in, getting in and doing with Azure? So there's that, like absolutely reach out to us, flick us an email, we're keen to hear from you. Okay, a couple of job opportunities. Um, I'm, I'm gonna hand this one over to Dan to do a bit of a prep for, for this one. So, cause uh, Dan's from Deloitte um, and he can sell much better than I can. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to tell everybody to read the slide, but uh, <laughs> basically, if you've got um, if you've got cloud integration skills, uh, we're definitely interested in hearing from you. So, excuse me. <coughs> um, as you can see, there's a few different technologies that we list here. Um, but uh, being being an Azure group, I'm sure there's some enthusiasts here who who have some of these skills. And if you're looking for a new adventure, uh, please reach out to us. You can scan that QR code. Uh, you can send a, an email to uh, Rebecca McDonald, uh, whose email is at the bottom there, or you can even just reach out to me. Uh, that's fine. And uh, yeah, we'd be happy to hear from you. And MOQ Digital. So last week we had a, a fantastic presenter. Oh, sorry, last month. My bad, wasn't it? <laughs> um, had a fantastic presentation from uh, MOQ Digital. They're, they're also looking to grow. Um, and Based on the presenter and and what he was presenting, it looks like an amazing place. So, if you are keen to join MOQ Digital, reach out. There's uh, there's a careers link um, where you can find out more information. There's lots of roles up there. They're looking pretty cool. Um, and finally, uh, Clued In. So, I've recently joined Clued In. Um, they're a really cool company looking to do master data management. Um, and clued in are, are looking for people who've got a, a bit of a broad range of skills. Um, so not necessarily developer, not necessarily purely infrastructure, but people who can help the team on their Azure journey and take take them forward and do some pretty cool things in Azure. So check out the company on LinkedIn. Um, Did, I have to to to, Did I have Sorry. to commute to Copenhagen now? Uh, you don't have to. 
But you may do. <laughs> I, I think the uh, the COVID nineteen will uh, constrain a little bit of that, uh, you know, for the short time. But when things change in, in the world, things might change. So, yeah, connect up. There's some great opportunity there. There's a bunch of really smart people. Uh, it's a pretty cool, relaxed um, gig, and it's it's really cool. And we're we're going into Azure in a big way, so check it out. Uh, and Master Data Management. And if you look at some of the Microsoft Docs for Master Data Management, you'll see some clued-in stuff there. Um, all right, so let's start off with something warm and fuzzy. Not the cactus because that's not fuzzy, but it's quite prickly. But uh, Arizona Data Center, West US three, it's uh, it's going to be a sustainable data center for uh, Microsoft, and Microsoft's on a bit of a journey to uh, create a sustainable um, data center across all of their data centers. Um, they're bringing in some really cool technologies to lower the water use as well as lower the power use. Um, they're they're partnering with. Um, Sunstreams, which is a big um, photovoltaic, you know, solar panel, solar plant in in Arizona, um, to fully offset all of the energy used in this data center. So it's it's kind of a, a pretty big thing as we move into a bit more of a green world. Um, and it's great to see that some, you know, cloud data centers they use a little bit of power. So it's great to see that we're starting to get sustainable data centers coming on online and, and it's awesome to see. It'd be interesting um, to see how that affects the pricing for that power center, you know, like are the, would, would the prices be cheaper for the services? Well, yet to be seen. I, I'm, I haven't seen anything where they're going to charge you extra for it, but, but um, maybe. Um, but sun in Arizona is fairly cheap, so I don't know how much more expensive it could be. Interesting on this one here, a bit of the chatter on this one was, well, before they went green there, they were kind of already green because it was nuclear. But <laughs> this is like cool green, not glowing green. So <laughs> it's it's much better version of green. <laughs> um, so New Relic 1 in Azure Spring Cloud. So you've heard a lot lately about Azure Spring Cloud. So bringing Spring and the Java community more into the fold in Azure. Um, that's been happening, well, it's been happening for quite a while, but of late, the, the tempo of releases and updates for Azure Spring Cloud has increased a lot. Um, and so this, this allows you to transition your monitoring in, in probably if you are Java-based, you probably good chance you're using New Relic. Uh, New Relic's a great tool. Um, it's not the one I use. I do use App Insights because App Insights is great in Azure, but I have used this one in the past and it is really good. Um, and now you can just sort of lift and shift that in with your Spring Cloud workloads and, and you get that seamless experience and transition as you start uptaking some of the other Azure services. Um, so I think, Wayne, we are going to get a sneak. Am I taking a funder if I'm saying we're going to get a sneak preview of some of this? You get a little look at this, yeah. <laughs> a little look at this. So there's some cool stuff coming with uh, Image Builder. Um, make it a little bit easier to put together some of your VMs. Um, it's uh, built on HashiCorp's Packer. Uh, so if, you, if you're familiar with some of this, it's a, it's a great step forward of its... Uh, you know, a great way to to pick up and get get used to building VMs um, in Azure. So it's it's great. Uh, another thing. So we were talking about um, Java. We're talking about Java quite a bit tonight. So uh, JBoss EAP um, has just gone GA. So it's been there for a while. It hasn't been GA, um, but now that Red Hat. JBoss Enterprise Application Platform has gone GA, so fully supported. Um, if you're a Java dev, it's a fantastic option um, to go on app service. Uh, so NFS 3.0 has uh, gone GA as well, so it's been in preview for a bit. Um, so this gives you hierarchical structures and allows you to do a whole bunch of stuff 
um, that people have been after for quite a while. So it's great to see that go from blob storage. Um, I think it, from memory, I think it optimizes for uh, read access on blob storage. So there's some things to look at, look into there. It's pretty cool um, that they've actually got that going GA. Um, a couple of things have dropped from pricing perspective. It's just worth like seeing some of the changes, um, you know, amortized costs. That was there originally for some of the, so I can't actually remember which one, but they've started to, you know, introduce the same sort of view for a lot more of the services. Um, yeah, like cost analysis for reservations. Um, there's a bunch of stuff there that's happened this month. So the link down below if you're interested in some of those cost updates. Um, and I think we're just going to drop into some of the events. So integration down under. So Dan, um, Dan's one of the, the leaders for integration down under. So wave. <laughs> um, it's, it's an awesome meetup to go to. So if you want to get more into the logic apps and the DevOps and, and all the integration bits, definitely check it out. It's an awesome meetup. Um, and a couple of the resources that we, we put up there often. So Slack channel, the YouTube channel, um, a couple of really cool uh, learning uh, resources, especially the 30 days to learn it. Um, these are some of the blogs that I like. So if you've been here often, you'll hear me bang on about these blogs. They're pretty cool. Um, I love Scott Scott's blog. Um, and I'm starting to use the um, terminal, Windows terminal. I don't know how many people are using that at the moment, but I'm starting to use that a lot more lately. It's great. All right, cool. So, all right, without any further ado, <laughs> I'm going to hand it over to Wayne. So Thanks, Wayne's, Wayne's working for Cloud Guru. He's putting together awesome training. Um, he's got a huge amount of experience and he, I've only known him for a short time, but I can put my hand on my heart and say, without a doubt, the most awesome uh, person with the infrastructure experience that I've ever seen and the most awesome approach. So I, yeah, I don't know how I, how I can do you a bigger rap than that. It's <laughs> no, like... it's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe a little bit excessive, to be honest. <laughs> well, not really. So from what I've seen, Azure DevOps infrastructure with ARM as a mainstay, I kind of want to put that out there for every, every, all the infrastructure guys out there. Look up to this guy because <laughs> that's the way to do infrastructure in Azure. That's it. That's all I'm going to say. That's the... awesome. <laughs> Thanks for that. Am I okay to steal that screen share? Go for it. Uh, let me just fix up my teams here because it likes to minimize when I share my screen, but I don't need it to minimize. <laughs> All right. Th um, thanks, everyone, for coming tonight. I um, I appreciate everyone taking their time to come and learn a little bit about Azure Virtual Desktop and um, have to listen to me. So um, I appreciate everyone taking time out of their day to do that. Um, so, yeah, as, as, as um, uh, Damien and Dan have said, we're going to look at Azure Virtual Desktop today. And if you haven't been following closely, you'll notice that uh, it recently changed from Windows Virtual Desktop to Azure Virtual Desktop. So then Microsoft did a little, little name change there uh, very recently. Uh, so let's uh, jump in. Uh, we're not going to get this to click to the next one. Yeah, so a little bit about me. We've already done already done some of this. So yeah, Azure Training Architect very recently joined A Cloud Guru, um, and um, it, uh, like Damien said, 20 years experience in IT, focusing on Microsoft infrastructure, DevOps, and cloud. Um, uh, I'm a big believer in lifelong learning and that growth mindset. That's just a buzzword for many people. But for me, it means just stay hungry, keep learning new things, keep growing um, and keep being better. And everything you do should be better than the previous day. Uh, so that's what that's about for me. Um, and over my uh, uh, that lifelong learning, I've achieved over 20 Microsoft certifications over that time uh, as well. Um, and um, in a range of technologies, they are... Um, uh, I'll just go back one uh, in, you know, my Windows Server, System Center, Exchange Server, SQL Server, Azure, you name it. I've got a certification in it, basically. 
Uh, now, I am uh, one of the organizers of the Brisbane Infrastructure DevOps user group as well. It's a very small user group, uh, also based in Brisbane, um, where we talk about uh, automation and DevOps from an infrastructure perspective. Uh, and DevOps seems to be like, a it's either like infrastructure or developer focused, and it really should be both. Um, so we kind of think of ourselves as infrastructure developers and we hang out in that user group. So feel free to check that out if it's something that interests you. Um, and yeah, connect with me on LinkedIn. If you've got any Azure questions or you just want to talk Azure, uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn. I love talking Azure. <laughs> All right. So uh, what we're going to cover tonight, we'll just go through what is virtual desktop. That's the headline of the talk. So obviously we'll cover that one. Uh, and then we'll look at when would you use it? So in what scenarios would Azure virtual desktop and if I call this Windows Virtual Desktop, please forgive me because the name change was very recent and I've been using it for a long time as WVD and Windows Virtual Desktop. So if I call it that, forgive me. Uh, so yeah, when would I use Azure Virtual Desktop? We'll cover that. Uh, and then how does it all hang together? And I'll cover this at a fairly high level, but I'll have a lot of stuff floating around in the background if people want to ask questions um, and get more information about things. If you want to see how it all works and how it really ticks, then feel free to ask a question throughout. Um, and then um, we'll do a demo. And when I say a demo, I'll just literally just take you through the portal and show you the components. And then we'll connect into an, uh, a virtual desktop and sort of have a look how it's configured. And we'll jump onto a domain controller and have a look at how some group policy is configured and stuff like that. And nothing too serious, but just give you a bit of an idea so it's like more familiar when it comes time for you to go and do some Azure virtual desktop. This might be something that you'll come back to, refer back to and say, oh yeah, I remember Wayne saying something about FS logics or something, some random word. What, what, was, the, what was the key things I need to remember about that? And that's where this, you know, this talk would potentially become a reference for you in future. Um, we'll cover some best practices and field notes. So uh, I've implemented an Azure Virtual Desktop solution uh, in my previous role. Uh, and uh, so I've been on the ground um, client facing. Uh, and so I, I sort of know what to expect. So I'll cover some of those things with you as well. The best practices is like Microsoft said you should do these things. Um, and then the field notes are the things that I've learned as part of that. Uh, so a little bit of uh, both of those things. Uh, so yeah, so what is um, Azure Virtual Desktop? Um, so it is desktop and application virtualization in the cloud. It allows you to present a full Windows desktop or a remote application to your users. Um, so this will be very familiar, like if you've used uh, Citrix or VMware View or um, a remote, remote desktop services or remote app, any of those things, if they sound familiar, this is like the Azure version of those things. Uh, it runs on Azure. And in fact, you can still get like like a Citrix layer um, atop a uh, Windows, virtual, sorry, Azure Virtual Desktop if you want to. Um, so there's still some similarities there. Uh, like I said, it was formerly uh, Windows Virtual Desktop. So when you're searching around for like information about this, sometimes, I don't know why, why this happens, but Microsoft likes to rename it and then all your search results are harder. Like if you just look at, how do I do the thing again? You got to search for it. You got to search for both Azure Virtual Desktop and then go, oh no, that's right. It'll be called Windows Virtual Desktop on someone's blog because they haven't gone and renamed it or it hasn't been indexed yet. So it makes it a little bit harder to find. Try both names. Um, and um, the one of the big things about uh, Windows Virtual Desktop and why, um, and I've just called it Windows Virtual Desktop, there you go. Um, one of the big things about it is I found that everyone, most companies have that one app, that app that no one has spent much time on. It runs on Windows and it's like built on .NET or, you know, something like that. And it only runs on Windows. But we want that to be available to everyone when a pandemic hits. <laughs> we want everyone to be able to work from home and then access this one crucial Windows app that's no one, that no one bothered to care about. And um, that's where I think Windows Virtual Desktop is really handy. So uh, one of the other things that Windows, uh, sorry, Azure Virtual Desktop gets you to, uh, allows you to do is run multi-session Windows 10. So if you're not familiar with this, um, normally you can only run multiple user sessions on a like a remote desktop server, formerly a terminal server. Uh, now you can run uh, multiple sessions on a, a Windows 10 OS. And this is very impressive the way Microsoft has done this. And I kind of like, once I've seen it, I kind of wondered why did it take so long? Why didn't we get this with Windows 7? Um, it's really nice. Um, so it also provides an, an excellent user experience. Like I've used this and this performs really well. Um, I, I, I really struggle to see any real advantages to going a, to like a non-Microsoft solution for this. 
Um, it, it, the performance is amazing. The response times are amazing. The graphical quality that it can deliver is amazing. Um, I've really found it provides a great user experience. Uh, and you can get even faster user experiences. They've got some preview features and some very new features coming out that allow you to do even faster connection times, faster response times than what I've seen in the field. Um, now, and when I say an excellent user experience, part of that is the apps are available on like almost everything. The only thing I couldn't find an uh, like a client app to connect to Azure Virtual Desktop with was Linux. It does support like Linux thin clients, but I couldn't see any support for uh, Linux distributions itself. But it does have a web version, uh, and you can get onto an Azure Virtual Desktop directly through the web, uh, which is great. And there's uh, pro a new profile management uh, technology that Microsoft acquired just prior to them um, uh, rolling out Azure Virtual Desktop. It's called FS Logics, and we'll cover that a little bit in more detail tonight. It's excellent. I, I love it. I've used um, Citrix profile management in the past, and I've used um, uh, uh, roaming user profiles, user environment virtualization, that sort of stuff. This is just so much better than all of those that, that, that's been done previously. As soon as I implemented it, I was extremely happy with this technology. Uh, Microsoft did a great job acquiring that company. <laughs> now, another thing that Azure Virtual Desktop does very well is it improves the uh, security, uh, the security posture of your organization. Everything's encrypted, as you'd expect, like everything, all the traffic in transit is encrypted, uh, and the data doesn't need to leave Azure. All you're really sending is like screen refreshes and audio um, to the end users. And they call this, um, in, I was formerly a desktop virtualization specialist at um, a regional council. Uh, and prior to that, I did Citrix desktop virtualization as well. And um, they call that eyes only security. It means that the, the person can only take what they can see. Um, when you can't stop them taking what they can see really anyway. Uh, so no data leaves your data center and ends up on a home PC somewhere when someone's working remotely in the kitchen or something like that. Um, so a lot of good security features there in Azure Virtual Desktop. And it supports everything that Azure AD supports. So you get MFA, you get conditional access, um, and this allows you to have really good control over your software updates. I don't know if anyone has seen, um, uh, like try to manage your mobile fleet with like System Center and trying to keep all those software app applications up to date when they're only occasionally connected to the VPN and they're roaming all over the world. And they end up with outdated applications all over the place. What this does is centralizes your operating systems, therefore centralizes your applications, and then allows you to keep them up to date much more easily than what they would if they were roaming around all over the place. Um, they could be drifting out of compliance, for example. Um, has there's excellent management tools for Azure Virtual Desktop. Setting up WVD, sorry, Azure Virtual Desktop is extremely easy, um, almost too easy uh, to get started. Uh, it gets complicated when you try and start to add some more stuff in there, but I'll cover what that what I mean by that tonight. Um, but it's very easy to get set up and it's very easy to manage. Uh, and I've got heaps of scripts available if anyone's interested in knowing uh, how I've built the environment tonight. Uh, I've got uh, PowerShell, uh, CLI, and ARM versions of everything I built tonight. I've deployed everything with ARM templates tonight, but I have got the other copies as well if you want them. Um, now, uh, so all of those are available for deploying um, Azure Virtual Desktop, and it's extremely cost-effective as well. I, I, I can't believe how cheap it is to run Azure Virtual Desktop in comparison to some of the other competing products. Um, so I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the licensing options is Windows Server, and you can deploy Windows Server and, and in Azure uh, as a virtual machine, add that as a session host, and then I'll explain what those terms are later on as well. And you can use just remote desktop services CALs to license the end users to connect into that. Obviously, you'll have to license the software and all that sort of stuff, but remote desktop services CALs with software assurance are extremely cost-effective and an extremely cost-effective way to get people access to this service. You can also use your existing E3, F3, E5 licenses as well. All of those, most people, like you've got Microsoft 365, you've already got one of these licenses uh, for, your, for your end users. So you're probably already licensed to use Azure Virtual Desktop. Uh, and you can, um, and all you'll have to do is pay for the compute and the storage if you've got storage as well. And you can reserve compute to save money, and you can also do like auto automatic scaling to save money as well. And you might do a combination of that. You might reserve a small amount of instances that are on 24/7, uh, and or you might uh, and then you might scale the rest. Um, and or you might have a follow the sun model where you reserve the baseline that you expect. You know, like you might have your Brisbane office and your Perth office, and you might 
um, reserve a small amount, but then scale the rest. So it's very cost effective. Uh, any questions on that before I move on? You can use the um, raise hand if you want to ask a question at any time, by the way. Uh, and I'll, I'll just stop and actually um, take your question straight away because I feel like sometimes the questions are extremely valuable in context um, and, and less valuable at last after the fact. So feel free to raise your hand or um, just yell out if I don't see your hand um, and ask a question along the way. Uh, so when would I use it? Uh, so uh, one of the reasons you'll use Azure Virtual Desktop is to um, meet security requirements and uh, and I spoke about those just moments ago. So it significantly increases the security posture of your Windows desktop fleet by allowing you to lock down your roaming devices. And they don't even need to be company owned devices. These um, these devices that are roaming could be any like bring your own device um, that don't need to be managed by the company and they don't need to contain any company data. Uh, and you can uh, secure your Azure virtual desktops very easily. Or you could have a very locked down mobile devices that people use that have very limited access to things. And that allows you to significantly increase your security posture. Uh, and it also is a place where you can run, and I believe this is still the case, that you can still run Windows 7 uh, in Azure Virtual Desktop as well. Updated patch Windows 7, by the way, I mean. Not, <laughs> not some rogue, uh, and, well, not, and not have to pay extra for it either. Uh, Windows 7 in Azure Virtual Desktop is it the only place you can run that securely without paying extra as well. And I'm not even sure you can still pay extra. It's not something I've been too involved with running Windows 7. Uh, and um, another reason to use uh, Azure Virtual Desktop is when your workforce changes drastically, you know, you might have very small numbers of people working at certain times of the day and very large numbers of people working at other times of the day. Um, Azure Virtual Desktop is excellent in this scenario. Or maybe your company is growing drastically and you can't keep up with shipping laptops to people. Azure Virtual Desktop is excellent for that. Also, when pandemics hit and everyone needs to work from home tomorrow, that's also another great reason to use Azure Virtual Desktop. Uh, and I'll ju actually jump, uh, jump the gun there. So facilitating remote work and bring your own device. So that's another great reason to use it. And like I said, it supports, I've, I, I connect to my Azure Virtual Desktops that I've tested with my uh, with my iPad Pro, excellent way to work. Uh, battery life is forever. And you get that full power of a Windows uh, when you're connecting in. So I highly recommend uh, bring your own device scenarios. And um, another reason uh, to do this is to support those legacy apps. So we all know that we wanna be moving to cloud native uh, applications, web-based, software as a service type solutions. And, uh, but not everyone's there yet. Like we're all going through our own journeys getting to that point. And uh, supporting legacy apps that run on Windows 7 or uh, require Windows and require a Windows desktop environment, uh, that's a great reason to use um, Azure Virtual Desktop as well. Uh, any questions on that one before I move on? It's cool, I'll jump in. So um, how does it work? So uh, Microsoft has a pretty good diagram of explaining how this works, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to do like a 10,000 feet view, and then I'll and then we'll drive in and have a look at the nitty gritty a little bit more. And then if you want to ask questions and work out even more about it, we can jump in further. Uh, and I wanted to keep it reasonably high level because I imagine you know people who are coming to a talk called "What is virtual, Azure Virtual Desktop" will have varying levels of experience. From I've never heard of it before in my life to I use it every day and I just want to find out if I'm missing out on anything. Uh, so bear with me while I go through some of this stuff. So. At a very high level, you have an end user they need to connect into a Windows desktop. And then you have the Azure Virtual Desktop Service, and then you have a virtual machine running Windows. It could be Windows Server or Windows 10 or Windows 7, like I said. Now, that virtual machine, uh, they call it a session host, it, it registers itself with the Azure Virtual Desktop Service, and then the end user connects to the Azure Virtual Desktop Service. And this uses a reverse connect, sorry, a reverse connect technology so the connection from the virtual machine inside Azure is outbound and the user's connection is outbound. So you don't need inbound connections on either side, uh, which is excellent from a security perspective. There's no public IPs on your Azure side and there's no public IPs exposed ports on your, on your client side either. It's extremely secure from that perspective. And this is how Microsoft explains it. And I'll borrow this image from Microsoft. Uh, this is how Microsoft explains the service. So Microsoft takes care of that web client that I spoke about, that the connectivity, so the load balancing and the gateway and all that sort of stuff for connecting in, uh, diagnostics, you know, information collection about how the service is working, all those management tools I spoke about, so the portal, Azure PowerShell, and the CLI, 
Uh, and then that that broker for actually finding you a desktop to connect to. There's hundreds in the background, at least to find one and connect you to that one service. And then Microsoft obviously provides the Azure cloud, which gives you that compute, that storage, and that networking capability you need to deploy virtual machines and make them available to your end users. Now, the responsibility that you have is you have to handle that profile management, you have to handle that scaling, so scaling up and down as, as the needs change. And Microsoft provides tools to make this easier. And to be honest, it's really easy to write your own as well. You can use Microsoft's tool and you can write your own very quickly. Uh, and the, the um, networking policy, like security rules, uh, network security groups and that sort of thing. Uh, and then your, you know, your firewalls, um, so your perimeter security as well, that's all your responsibility. And Azure Active Directory, all your uh, identity management is all your responsibility as well. And then the big chunk, is the actual uh, virtual machines and the apps that run on those virtual machines. And I'll explain why I call that the big chunk, um, because I feel like it's the smallest part on this diagram, but I feel like it's the part where you're going to spend the most of your time. <laughs> so um, Microsoft takes care of a lot for you. Uh, any questions on that before I jump in? And I will jump into this in a lot more detail on the very next slide. Um, but if any of that wasn't clear, then feel free to raise your hand and I'll take questions. All right, moving along. So how do you deploy it? Uh, I've got uh, six steps for success here. And uh, and then there's the, there's the yes celebration at the end. So uh, let's let's jump in and have a look at each of these. So the first thing you're going to need to do is you're going to need to get those licenses I spoke about. You're going to need to get an E3, F3, E5 license or RDS CALs to allow you your users to connect in. And you'll need Windows, um, uh, if you're not using Windows Server, if you're using Windows 10, or Windows 7, you'll need that Windows Enterprise license that you get uh, uh, to allow your users to connect in as well. There actually is a, a Windows E3, I forget what it's called. It's like a Windows th E3 license that just gives you Windows without Office. You can buy that as well. Microsoft likes to throw these things in exams. That's how I know about that. So um, you can get your Windows licenses or your Microsoft 365 licenses, which, licenses, which you probably already own. Um, or you can buy RDS CALs and run run Windows Server. So first step, get your licenses, which you probably already have. Second step is you're going to need to get Active Directory in Azure. So you're going to need to sync. If you've got on-premises Active Directory, you're going to need to sync that up to Azure Active Directory. And a lot of you probably already have this done. If you're using Microsoft 365, you probably already have this in place. Uh, now, the other part of that is you're going to also need to have AD running in Azure. Not just Azure AD, but Active Directory. So that can be, um, you know, traditional domain controllers deployed to VMs, or it can be Active Directory domain services. Now, if you're a, a, an organization uh, that is already has on-prem Active Directory, like most of us do, um, then you're probably going to want to just deploy additional domain controllers up in Azure and then connect your um, your network with your virtual network in Azure using one of the technologies they've got there, like Express Route or VPN Gateway. Now, once you get those two, those networks connected and you get the domain controllers deployed up in Azure uh, and you're gonna need to sync Active Directory as well. And I'll explain why you need to sync Active Directory a little bit later and why you need Active Directory in the cloud as well, because there's actually like two layers of authentication that occur here. Uh, so you need to get all that up and running and that's relatively straightforward. Uh, the next step is you're going to need to configure your profile management. And I spoke about um, FS Logics before. So FS Logics is Microsoft's um, uh, profile management tool for Azure Virtual Desktop. Uh, and it, it uses VHD based profiles, which is great because the logon times are like that. And it just mounts the VHD transparently in the background and then logs the user on. There's none of this copying files down when they log on and copying them, they're copying them off nonsense that we've seen from the previous versions of profile management. So you're going to need to configure FS logics. And one of the ways to do this is you can configure a, an Azure storage account. And there's many ways. You could actually just run a Windows server with a file share on it and then point FS logics at that. Uh, you can also uh, configure a file share in Azure, like an Azure file share on a storage account. And then you'll need, if you do want to do that, you'll need to domain join that storage account. And there's a PowerShell module, um, Azure Files Hybrid, AZ Files Hybrid or something like that it's called. There's a good docs article that tells you how to um, join your Active Directory storage account, your uh, Active Directory storage account and its file shares. Join that to Active Directory so that people who are on your Active Directory domain, not your Azure Active Directory domain, I just want to make sure there's a difference between those people understand the difference between those two those users can authenticate against the file share. 
because they're going to be logging onto a Windows PC with potentially no access to the Azure identity layer at the top. They will have that, but they don't necessarily need to to access a file share where their profile would be stored. So that's why you need to have this um, file share, uh, the storage account domain joined. And you'll need to set permissions. And Microsoft loves, like I said, they like to, uh, I've done the Azure Virtual uh, Azure Virtual Desktop Certification Exam recently. Microsoft loves to throw these sort of things in exams. So if anyone's preparing for that or thinking about preparing for that, this is a good one to know as well. Uh, you need to set the permissions at the share layer. So just like a traditional Windows file server, you need to set the, set the permissions at the share level and then at the NTFS level. So you're setting it and at the share level, you're actually setting that in Azure Active Directory. And then at the NTFS level, you're setting that in Active Directory. So this sounds ridiculously complicated, but it's actually like a very short process. It'll take you 10 minutes, maybe. Um, depending, you're probably quicker than I am. <laughs> so uh, get, get that, get FS Logics or get profile management configured. And you can even use um, NetApp files if it's available in the region, region that you're deploying to. Uh, you can use an Azure file share or you can use a Windows server to store your FS Logics profiles. Now, the next step after that is you're going to need to create your desktop image. Now, you, you're going to want to put a bunch of software on there and Microsoft will ship a little bit of software um, depending on the image that you pick when you deploy your virtual machines. Microsoft will give you some software. So you can pick images from Microsoft that are like multi-session Windows 10 with Office 365. And little tip, that also comes with FS Logix as well, built in. So you don't need to deploy that software. You'll get, you'll get and this is what I mean by getting it set up fast, you'll get... Um, uh, you'll get Windows 10, Microsoft 365 apps, and you'll get FS Logix, which is everything you need to get connected in. You don't actually need to deploy any additional software if you don't have any custom software to deploy. But if you do, um, there's a bunch of tools that you can use to do that. So you can use a, a new technology, just went GA like, we, like Damien said at the start. You can use Azure Image Builder to build your images. And the way that works is um, you build, it's basically building a task sequence. If anyone's familiar with um, System Center mm -hmm. um, Configuration Manager or similar tools, you're basically building a task sequence of things that you want to install in order in an ARM template. And then you hand that off to Microsoft in Azure and they go and build you a sysprepped image. And then you can deploy your uh, Azure Virtual Desktop images off that sysprepped image. And they handle the sysprepping for you. So that's one way um, to get mm -hmm. it set up. And another way is you can deliver your apps using a fairly new technology called MSIX App Attach. And if you haven't had a look at this, check it out. Microsoft is doing some cool stuff with this. And it allows you to um, attach your images when the users ask for them. So they don't actually exist on the image. So you can update them and maintain them separately from your operating systems. And then you can direct the, the user to a storage account where these packaged MSIX apps exist. And then when they launch them, it launches them from that storage account. So you're decoupling, um, if you're familiar with that term, you're decoupling the operating system from the applications and the management life cycles of those two things, um, which makes management much more easy, much more easy, much easier. <laughs> uh, now, the next part is you're going to need to deploy your Azure Virtual Desktop infrastructure. Now, um, this is probably like, this is going to where the step four and five is going to be where you spend most of your time. You're probably going to spend most of your time in step four. Uh, step five, uh, so you're going to deploy um, your virtual machines and then you're going to um, register them as session hosts in what Microsoft calls host pools. And I'm giving you some terms here and I'll show you in the portal where these things are so they make more sense as well. So you deploy your virtual machines, register them as session hosts into host pools. Uh, and the, these virtual machines need to be able to find Active Directory to authenticate your users. So you're going to need to configure custom DNS on your virtual network to allow it to find those domain controllers and then domain join those virtual machines and then uh, con connect your users into those virtual machines. And so you'll, you'll add those um, to host pools and the host pools is where you configure uh, the options around how you want to spread your users across across those um, session hosts, those virtual machines that Microsoft has got there. So you'll use, uh, uh, they've got two types, they've got depth and breadth first. Now, they're crazy names, but what it basically means is depth means put as many users as you can on a, on a single virtual machine until it's full, 
and, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you Microsoft what the limit is, by the way, it's going to be seven or eight or whatever the size of the virtual machine is. And once that virtual machine is full, then move to the next one and then fill that virtual machine out. That's depth first. The other option is um, breadth first, where you say, spread my users across all of my available virtual machines until they're evenly distributed and then start spreading them across again and then start spreading them across again so they're all evenly distributed now you can imagine that depth first gives you a really good value because you're saying i want to use the one vm until it's fully utilized and then i want to use the next vm and then breadth first gives you um, really good user experience because you're not going to have those 10 people trying to log on at the same time, all trying to log onto a VM and thrashing the CPU and the disk and the memory at the same time. So breadth first for performance and depth first for um, uh, saving money, basically. And you may use a combination of these two. I've got to be honest here. What I did um, in my previous role was I uh, configured breadth first early in the morning and then we just flip the switch to go to depth first later in the day when there's no log on storm they call it in the old desktop virtualization days there's no 20 or 100 people trying to thousand people trying to log on at the same time um it you can convert from breadth first to depth first to try and consolidate those hosts back down again once once people log off for lunch or log off for the day now um and like I said, um, that depth first, you're going to need to, on the host pool, you're going to need to set a maximum session limit. So I want a maximum of seven or eight or 10 or 20 or whatever it might be users on each virtual machine. And you'll set that on the host pool as well. The other decision you'll need to make about the um, host pools is uh, you'll need to configure whether they are personal or whether they are pooled. Now, personal uh, uh uh, host pools are useful for people who have very specific requirements or might require administrative privileges on their virtual machines. That's where you'll give each person their own Azure virtual machine. Now you can imagine this is going to get very expensive very quickly if you're giving each person their own Azure virtual machine, but there are scenarios where they might need that. So you can do personal uh, host pools or you can do and um, on the, with that personal host pools, you can either directly assign them a VM and say, you know, like, uh, Michael, you're going to have that virtual machine, and Matt, you're going to have that Michael. Uh, that, sorry, that virtual machine. Um, or you can just let them pick one, and then when they get that one, they stick with it. Or you can do pooled um, host pools, and that is where you're just going to say, give them any of the session hosts that are available in that pool, um, and profile management will handle their customization, so they don't need to have, um, they don't need to be bound to a specific virtual machine when they log on. And in that pooled scenario is where you have to worry about the scaling and the depth and breadth first stuff. Uh, personal VMs, obviously none of that applies because they're looking, it's a one-to-one -one re um, relationship uh, between personal and uh, virtual machines. Uh, I'm covering a lot of new topics here, so feel free to come back and watch this recording. I know we're recording, so feel free to come back and watch this stuff later if um, I haven't made sense or um, and hit, hit me up on LinkedIn if you've got any questions as well. Now, one more thing is you're going to need to add those host pools that we've created. So we've got all our VMs and we've got our VMs in host pools. And now you're going to um, define applications off that host pool. And you might say, I want to give Excel to the finance team. And then you'll create an application group. You'll create a remote app for Excel. And then you'll give that to the finance team. Now, that's one way of delivering applications. You can deliver specific applications to specific groups of people. Another way is you can just deliver the full desktop experience. I want everyone you know, in uh, marketing to be able to access a Windows desktop. Uh, and that'll use this session host pool. Uh, and uh, and they'll get a desktop. And that's another way to do it. So you can do desktops or you can do remote apps, and then you add that to an application group, and then you'll grant your users access to that application group. So you'll say, you know, finance team, you'll have access to this set of apps. Uh, marketing, you'll have access to this set of apps. And then you'll add your applications to a workspace. Now, what's weird about this is people always think, oh, I must, I must have to assign my users to a workspace, but you don't. You actually assign them to the application group, not the workspace. And then the workspace is just like a friendly name that they'll see when they connect. One of one of many friendly names they'll uh, see when they connect. So an application group is like, oh, sorry, a um, workspace is like a group of application groups. So apps, and then they're grouped into application groups, and then application groups are grouped into workspaces. Microsoft loves to create these hierarchies of things to help us work out how we want to best deploy them. And then I know there was a lot there, and I'll cover that in the portal as well, just to I'll recap that as well. And then you're going to deploy and configure the clients that are, that are going to connect in. So there's a, a TXT DNS record you can create, um, uh, underscore MS RADC. You create that um, tech 
txt record in your dns service and then you tell that'll tell your clients when they log on with your uh, company's credentials this is where azure virtual desktop is and then that'll automatically configure their clients they don't need to remember some crazy url to type in when they connect uh, so you'll um, configure a dns record and then you'll deploy your um, remote desktop client out to your users so they can connect into azure virtual desktop and that's the six steps for success. And I know that was a lot. I actually feel short of breath going through those. So I know there was a lot there. Um, any questions on that um, before I move on and we can have a look in the portal? Cool. Uh, let's do a bit of a demo. I'll just wake my mouse up. There we go, mouse is awake. Okay, uh, let's have a look at the portal here. All right, so I spoke about those components. So here's Azure Virtual Desktop, and this has only been recently renamed from Windows Virtual Desktop. I still go up here and type in Windows Virtual Desktop, as you can see here, which is hilarious. Uh, and it doesn't come up. <laughs> Microsoft didn't bother. They're like, nope, you learn the new name. It's happening. Uh, so this is this is those host pools I spoke about. And then you can see here, I've got a, a host pool configured. And then here's those host pool types and those load balancing uh, options that I spoke about. So I've gone, I've gone for a pooled host pool, and I've gone to say fill that virtual desktop up first, and then go to the next one, that depth first scenario I spoke about here. Um, and you'll notice that this is actually in East US, which is kind of odd because I'm not in East US. Now the reason for that is because there's only specific locations where you can actually have all the metadata associated with Azure Virtual Desktop deployed. It's Canada, uh, I think the UK and Europe and the US at the moment. And when I originally deployed Azure Virtual Desktop, you could only have this metadata in the US. So that's why this is in the East US, but the virtual machines will actually be in Australia East. Uh, so this is that host pool I talked about. I'll just quickly jump into that. Uh, and then you can see here, I've got one virtual machine. And then I've got um, this virtual machine is in here. Um, and uh, it's in, oh, so it's gonna show me the Australian, yeah, the Australia East, there we go. So I've got that, um, those Azure Virtual Desktop components in US East, and then I've got the actual virtual machine is in Australia East. And then um, I'll just go back up here. And this is obviously where you can do those things where you'd expect to see um, on a normal remote desktop environment. You can say like, I wanna drain this host to get everyone off it so I can do some maintenance on it, you know, and stop drain mode and that sort of thing. And this assign button is where, you, where you'll handle those personal assignments. You know, I want, um, Joe to have access to this this desktop because it's a um, uh, personal host pool. That's where you can assign them directly in the portal as well. Now I'll just go back out of that. And uh, while I'm on this screen here, when I said you need to register your virtual desktops um, with the Azure Virtual Desktop service, that's what this registration key button here is for. So you can uh, generate a registration key. And then when you install the Azure Virtual Desktop agent, you can provide either a registry key or a command line parameter to install, um, to uh, provide that registration key and say, I wanna register this VM with this host pool. And that's how those two, that's how those two things tie together. Um, and this also is where you can configure the um, remote desktop properties like um, clipboard redirection uh, and all that sort of thing uh, as well. You do that at the host pool level. So I'll just jump back out of that. Uh, the application groups is where you define uh, the actual applications that the users will access. And you can see here, I said there was remote app and then there was uh, desktop application groups. And here you can see I'm publishing a Windows desktop uh, to the users. And um, I've just got this one uh, desktop application group. Obviously location is East US as well for that metadata. Uh, so when people log on, they'll see this um, uh, application group and it'll be a Windows desktop. So that's all that is. And you can see, there's, see how it's like the the glue, it's tying the host pool to the workspace. So it's like the, the glue in between those two things. And this is where you assign the users as well. Uh, I, I'm expecting a user to be here. Oh, sorry, I've gone into the wrong spot, my bad. I need to go actually into the application group, my bad. <laughs> and then assignments, there we go. Uh, just wait for this. And then I've got a group in here where I'm saying these users are assigned access to this, uh, to this group of um, applications. So that's where that is. Uh, and I'll just go back to the Azure Virtual Desktop mode again. This user section here is actually people who are connected in at the time. I clicked on that accidentally. Uh, so if we go down to workspaces here, and then the, the workspace is just like that friendly uh, location where you publish your application groups to. So you can see I've got an application group 
and it's presenting a desktop called IT desktop. And this, this is actually funny getting this to appear. It doesn't appear. It, it, it can appear, but you can't actually deliver it with ARM templates, Microsoft. <laughs> um, so uh, this, this is what they'll see when they connect in. They'll see this desktop application here. Now, I want to quickly show you the storage account because there are some best practices. Uh, so I said uh, profile management is through FSLogix, and that's uh, like VHDs that connect when people log in. Now, I've deployed an Azure storage account to host these FSLogix profiles. Uh, let me just see. I don't think I have storage accounts there, so I'll just uh, storage accounts. Just have a look here. Now, um, I'll explain what that one is a little bit later because that is not my naming convention. <laughs> Thanks, Microsoft. Uh, now, this here is um, where I'm storing the user profiles, obviously, in Australia East as well. And if I go in there, I'll go down to, I just want to see um, when everything loads up. Uh, there's two things I wanted to show you in here. Actually, I'll just stop scrolling for a second. I'll find the one that I can find. So under networking, I just want to show you something here. This might look a little bit odd if you haven't used storage accounts in Azure a lot. Um, you can see here, nothing seems to have access to this account. Like I've said, allow access from selected networks, and then I've got I've got none here. <laughs> so no one's allowed access to this. And the reason that is like this is because I've actually configured a private endpoint. So what this does, if you're not familiar with Azure Private Link or Private Endpoints, I've actually configured um, this private endpoint, which drops a NIC in my virtual network for this storage account. So all of that traffic between my Azure Virtual Desktops and this storage account doesn't go through the public um, interface for the you know the public domain. Sorry, the public what would you call it? Access point for that storage account. It goes uh, across my through my VNet into that storage account, so it's entirely private. Um, and this is, there's some costs associated with doing this, but this is the best practice because the data never leaves your virtual network for your virtual machines. And you probably don't like, it's secure anyway, but it's probably better to not have your network leave, sorry, your data leave your network if you can help it. So that's what I've done to configure that there. Uh, and you could also do um, a service endpoint if you're familiar with that um, to get access. That's like a backup plan instead of a private link uh, to get access into your storage account as well. Um, so you get more direct access that way. Now, I just wanted to find shit. I'm just going to search for it because that menu is just getting longer and longer every day. These, they're getting too many features on these storage accounts. Uh, I'll just go into this. I've got one uh, file share created here. I've just called it data. And that file share is where we're storing, storing the FSLogix user profiles. Uh, so that's that. And feel free to, I'll just pause briefly between showing you th these things. So if you've got questions, just jump in or raise your hand and I'll, um, I'll take questions straight away. Because uh, like I said, those questions are excellent in context. Uh, now, I showed you the storage account. Let's, let's, let's connect to an Azure Virtual Desktop. So I'll just bring this over here. So I might actually just uh, see if this can work. I'm just going to unsubscribe here. Yep, unsubscribe. And then, so this is what, when they first install this remote desktop client, they'll get this. And then you'll hit, you can hit subscribe with URL, but that's horrible. You can create the text record that I spoke about, the TXT record that I spoke about in your DNS zone, and then they can hit subscribe. And then they'll just be able to type in their um, uh, user principal name. Um, so I'll just type in my admin account. Uh, that's just my demo domain. So I'll just go next here. Just punch in my I get that right. I usually get it wrong. Uh, I'm just going to say no. I don't want to hybrid Azure. I don't want to Azure AD join my device at this stage. I'll just go no. Just wait for that to find my um, desktops. So you see, I had that called IT desktop. The ARM template part of this doesn't seem to work for some reason, but I've been given access to the workspace. And then these are the applications in that workspace. And I've just got one desktop available to me here. I'm just going to change one setting. And this is a nice, nice little trick if you don't know this. So if you've been running Azure Virtual Desktop for a while, you might not know this. Uh, so I'll show you this one as well. Um, one of the things, I actually right click on that. And I go settings. And it's got this use default settings, but you can actually change that. And I actually just want to say, just use this display. So I'm sharing this screen. So I don't want it to appear across both screens and you'll miss the logon experience. I want to just show it just here. And this is where you can control, you know, all of these settings as well, which are handy for people. Some people want to have, like if you're working remote, you might be running Teams locally. I don't, there are scenarios where you might want to do that. 
or you might be running maybe your phone software locally on your PC, or and then you might be running Azure Virtual Desktop um, for everything else. So you might want you might not want to take up all your monitors, um, and this is where you configure those settings. So I'll just close that and then uh, go in here and launch that. Hopefully it connects. I did sacrifice many things to the uh, demo god, so I should be okay. Uh, apologies to all the things I sacrificed. I'll just do that. And now Apple's Logics is going to take forever just to make a liar of me. No, beautiful. Look at that. Look at that. I just, I just loaded my user profile. <laughs> it's so fast. Black screen of death. All right, and now I'm into my uh, Windows Virtual Desktop. Now, this one is very, this is very vanilla, vanilla, obviously. I've tried to save some time. I actually did nearly 500 deployments to Azure getting these demos ready for everyone. I just really wanted to touch on everything. So if someone asks a question, I can be like, yeah, I know the answer to that. I want to be that guy. <laughs> so I did a lot of deployments um, in setting this up just to really understand every single component of this. Uh, and I didn't spend any time on customizing the OS, but I will show you how you can do that. Now, uh, you'll notice this little extra icon here. This only appears when you're in full screen, but it's a very handy little icon to know about. Uh, when you click up here, you can see, um, you know, I said, you never wait, wait a minute. <laughs> Your network might be slow. Come on. I've never seen this before in my life. Uh, so anyway, your network might be slow. You might, you may experience issues. This normally says your network is awesome. But anyway, uh, network engineer, I need to talk to you. Anyway, so um, and then here you can see I've got a 22 millisecond response time to Azure in Sydney. Like this is awesome. This response time is amazing. People won't even know. Like, what is your monitor response time? I don't know everyone else, but like, unless you're a gamer, it's going to be like two milliseconds. Um, and mine's eight on my my desktop monitor. It's 22 milliseconds to Azure. Like, are you kidding? The performance of this is awesome. Uh, so yeah, love that. And this is obviously where you can go in and show people. Uh, you know, when people call up the help desk and complain about their Azure virtual desktop experience, you can direct them to that Wi-Fi looking icon up the top. That's what I call it, and say, check out the user experience there. Um, and um, see, you know, see how everything's going here, how much bandwidth, how many people are watching Netflix at your house at the moment while everyone's in lockdown. Uh, that's where you can see that information. And um, and then obviously the performance there. Now, one more thing I wanted to show you uh, is in here, uh, hopefully it, uh, yeah, here we go. So this is that uh, Azure file share. I'll just minimize my directed, redirected drive so that I don't, too much information here. There's that and that. So this is that Azure um, file share I spoke about, and I've obviously mapped that as a network drive here. You can see the name of it there. And I'll go into that, and then here's my user account. And there's a particular setting you need to do, and I'll show you this in group policy as well, to make this look like this. The default setting, I don't know who thought up with this, but it wasn't an, an, uh, an administrator. Um, the default setting for this is to have this reversed. So you get the SID first and then the username. That is completely crazy. And I'll show you the setting that you need to set to flip that back. Now, this is my user profile. It's just a VHD. And I've done it I've done it as a VH, uh, VHDX file. Where's my file extensions? Hopefully it actually listened to me. Oops, not, not item checkboxes. I don't want that. No one ever wants that. Uh, file name extensions. Uh, it didn't listen to me. <laughs> I asked for a VHDX file. Anyways, it's dynamically expanding. Um, maybe, maybe I changed the setting after I created it. But... Um, it's as a dynamically expanding disk as well, so you can configure this to use. If you and that's a, a default setting as well, is not to use dynamic disks, but you probably want to change that. You don't want these just creating massive 30 gig by default uh, user profiles every time someone logs on when they're not going to use anywhere near that much data for their uh, user profile. Uh, so that's that. Now I'll just uh, I'll just close that down. We might want to come back here. Any questions on that before I jump into a domain controller? So like I said, you want to deploy a domain controller to Azure. And um, I've deployed just one DC for this uh, demo environment. And um, I've actually been really lazy. Don't ignore that Azure Active Directory, Active, Active Directory Connect on my domain controller. Don't ever do this. <laughs> but I'm trying to save some money here for my demo environment. So I've deployed Azure Active Directory Connect on this domain controller as well. And I'll just run, uh, I'll just run Group Policy Management. Uh, Oh, and by the way, I'm connected with Azure Bastion here to get into this domain controller, so I don't need um, network access to the domain controller. So I actually have no connectivity uh, privately to this network. I can get into my domain controller via Azure Bastion, uh, and then I can get into my Windows Virtual Desktop through 
the Windows Virtual Desktop server. So I have no VPN connection or express route to Azure. There's no private connectivity between my home network and uh, you know where, I'm, where I am at the moment um, and Azure. Now uh, here, I just show, I wanted to show you one thing in group policy management. No, there's nothing too interesting other than this. Uh, uh, group policy objects just show you fs logics uh can i see it in settings maybe i can do it in settings i always get impatient waiting for settings to load uh we're just going to administrative templates here now there's a few best practices settings here uh this is where i've said can i please get dynamic vhdx files um i didn't get that but anyways I, that's what i asked for and then this is probably my mistake let's be honest uh and then I've also said delete the local profile when an FS logics profile should apply. So if, if for some reason someone's connecting into an Azure virtual desktop that has a local profile, like something's gone wrong with FS logics and they've got a local profile, I'm just sending it to delete that. And this is a choice. You can make this a cho choice yourself. But um, at the end of the day, you probably want to end up with this being turned on and delete those local profiles when FS logics should apply. Uh, set that dynamic VHD and then just want to enable FS logics and then. Um, this is where I'm saying put them. So there's that Azure storage account that I showed you. Now, these settings are all available as an ADMX. Uh, ADMX? I feel like I'm saying that wrong. <laughs> A group, so some group policy guru is going, that's not the right thing. Uh, <laughs> is on this call. So <coughs> thing. <laughs> Sorry. Um, not COVID. Uh, so uh, uh, yeah, so there's a, a, a Active Directory templates, uh, group policy templates file that you can grab. Uh, that uh, gives you all of these settings. You can also configure them in the registry, and that was the original way. You get those, I'm going to call them ADMX files until someone corrects me. You get those ADMX files and you um, put them, you can put them in the central store in Active Directory group policy, and then you can configure the settings like this. If you don't do that, you can configure them with the registry, and that was how it was originally done when they released this service. Uh, and then this is where I've said that you can swap that directory name component. So that's where you get the username first. I don't know like who thought it was a good idea to not have the username first, but that you definitely want to set that setting when you're setting up um, FS logics. Uh, so that's all I really had to show you on the uh, domain controller. I, actually, actually, there might be one more thing here. Uh, DNS, DNS.msc. Let's see if I get this right. Yeah, no, that's not the right thing. I want to get into uh, DNS management. Uh, let's just do it the old way. Does someone know the name for that? To get into DNS. Anyway, so I just wanted to show you one quick thing in here because this is a little gotcha that people might not know. Uh, just wanted to check here. Nope, good. Properties. Forwarders. Anyone want to put their hand up and tell me what that IP address is? Anyone know what that is? I'll tell everyone. <laughs> no one's going. No one's going to speak up and get it wrong. I'm not going to be that guy. But um, you, know, you wouldn't have got it wrong anyway. It's the Azure DNS server. Now, the reason I'm forwarding my domain, my DNS traffic to the Azure DNS server, uh, is because I'm using Private Link, which is that con private connectivity between the virtual desktops and the storage account. I'm forwarding it. Uh, my DNS traffic to Azure DNS, which will then forward it out to the internet as it needs to, but it's also going to help me resolve that private link, that IP address that I've got um, for that private connection to the storage account. So that's why I'm forwarding through there. And this is the easiest way to do it. If you've got a DNS server in Azure, um, uh, or all your DNS servers are in Azure, then um, you can use the forwarders here to say, hey, go here uh, for this. And I've obviously pointed my virtual machines to point to this DNS server. And then there's this DNS server falls to Azure as it needs to. So that was that. Uh, now I just want to show you. So I've deployed um, these uh, virtual desktops using desired state configuration. Is there any show of hands, any PowerShell or uh, let's start with that. Any PowerShell nuts on the call? Um, any any fans of PowerShell on the call? We're getting a couple of show of hands. That's good. Awesome. Thank you. So I've used um, PowerShell desired state configuration to uh, configure my uh, virtual desktops. Now, you don't have to do that. It's just how I wanted to do it. You could use any configuration tool you want to use. You could use Chef, Puppet, Ansible, you name it. 
Um, you can also do what I used to do back in 2013. Uh, you can also use a Word document with a list of the applications that you need to install and the command lines that you need to run to install them. No, don't do that. It's not it's not 2013 anymore. But you can if you really want to get started doing that. You just this is my is the order of things that I do to build my virtual desktops. Um, and but you can also use basically any automation tool, configuration management tool to manage your um, uh, to manage your virtual machines. So I'll just uh, show you how I did that. Where is my Visual Studio code? Bear with me here. So I'll just jump into uh, desired state configuration. All right, so can everyone see that OK? Is that text size too small? Please speak up if it's too small for you. I think I can zoom in if I need to. I can see it pretty well, but you maybe you can zoom in a little. I'll zoom in a couple of goes. There we go. It doesn't hurt. Um, for those older people on the call, like me. <laughs> so um, I'm approaching 40, by the way, so I'm feeling very old these days. Uh, so uh, now what I'm, I ignore this domain controller stuff. I'm actually managing my domain controller with DSC as well. Uh, so I'll just skip past all of this stuff. Uh, you can see that's where I am doing that forward or two, by the way. But skip past that domain controller stuff. This might be completely foreign, so please bear with me if you've never seen DSC before in your life. I just want to show you, it's not important what I've got written on the screen. It's important what I'm doing. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm adding in, this is authenticated users. Now you could probably do a group to make this more secure. I'm adding in authenticated users into the remote desktop users group for all of my Azure virtual desktops. Uh, and I'm also domain joining my Azure virtual desktops. And then I am installing the, um, uh, I'm actually downloading the agent and downloading the bootloader. There's two parts. There's the Azure Virtual Desktop Agent and the Azure Virtual Desktop Bootloader, and they get installed in that order. And then you can see here I'm installing the uh, uh, agent, the Remote Desktop Services Infrastructure Agent, now called the Azure Virtual Desktop Agent. <laughs> the name, oh, Microsoft, come on, guys. Anyway, so um, I'm installing the MSI that they give me uh, to set up the agent, and then I'm just passing in that registration token, which will register it with that host pool. Now you could do this with run command. You could do this with the scripts that you do as part of your ARM templates. You could use PowerShell remoting. You could log on to it and manually run this. Take your pick of any way you want to do that, but eventually you're going to need to, and you can also add that registration token as a registry key as well. At some point, you're going to need to run this installer and have that value passed so that it can register itself um, with the host pool. And then you're going to need to install the bootloader and then you're going to need to reboot and DSC is taking care of that reboot for me. It's like, okay, you need to reboot. So it just does that for me. Um, so that's how I am configuring, configuring. That's the bare minimum to get a virtual desktop up and running. running. So you need FS logics, which these Windows 10 images come with from Microsoft these days, which is great. They didn't used to. Then you need those two agents and you need it registered with the host pool. So that's how I'm doing that. Any questions? Any questions on that? There's many ways you could go about doing that. Now, um, so you'll see here, there's my um, configuration. These are all my resource groups um, for my um, ARM templates that I've deployed this infrastructure with. Now, uh, there are a couple that I really want to show you. I'm just going to show you AVD, this one here, this East US one. That's that East US, we told you about the metadata locations that we spoke about. Uh, oh, what have I done there? I clicked something silly. Um, now, actually, I do want this um, template outline. Just go into resources. So I have a host pool. So you can see depth first. There's not, there's not foreign. So you can see what depth first. I've actually set the max session limit to 999. I didn't want to hit a limit. Uh, and then, um, and then depth first, and then, um, and then it's pooled. So that's that stuff that we saw in the portal. Nothing too foreign here. That's the host pool. Here's the application group, uh, and it it's a desktop application group. So that's how I'm passing that, uh, creating that resource. And then I'll just quickly show you as well. And if anyone wants any of these ARM templates, or they want to see the PowerShell or the Azure CLI version of any of these things, let me know and I'll send them to you. Happy to share. Uh, I might even just put them on a GitHub repo or something if someone asks for them, that's fine. Uh, now, uh, and this is the workspace, um, that friendly space where all of your applications grow into. So that's the ARM templates for the Azure Virtual Desktop components. Now, uh, oops, I've, I've dragged something there I didn't want to drag. I've dragged my network spoke around. 
just want to stop dragging this entirely. <laughs> Bear with me while I'm an idiot. Um, <laughs> hilarious. Uh, so uh, that's that. Now, there's a lot more components in here. Like I've got a key vault for deploying my virtual machines and stuff like that. Uh, and then I've got a couple of resource groups for my hosts and my, my, my VMs and my host pool. And they're just normal virtual machines. Like there's nothing foreign here. Just a normal virtual machine configuration. This is an ARM template here. Um, nothing too nothing too serious there. Uh, and then uh, I just wanted to quickly show you Azure Image Builder. So this is something um, that Damien spoke about at the um, uh, uh, start of the uh, talk. Uh, so I, I got an underscore at the start of this because I'm having some trouble with it. This could just came out of preview into general availability. And I feel like Microsoft might have rushed this. It's good, but it's not what I would call perfect. And I'll say it's not what I would call perfect because it does some things that annoy people who are very particular. <laughs> and the particular thing that it does that annoys me is it creates its own resource group. Like you give it a, an identity and then it goes and spins up and creates its own resource group. And that resource group doesn't meet my naming convention. I'm very particular about these things. And that bugs me. I want to be able to name that. <laughs> and I can name it with things like Azure Backup, but I can't do it with this. So that I feel like it's not quite generally available yet, but Microsoft has made that decision. Now I'm just going to uh, skip past, there's a lot in here, but I want to skip past all of this just quickly. Because uh, I want to show you this part here. This customized section is the key part. So this, you think of this as the steps that you want to run when you build your Azure Virtual Desktop. So uh, this optimized OS is actually a um, is actually a there's a Windows Virtual sorry an Azure Virtual Desktop optimization tool. It's a PowerShell script you can get, and you run it against your session hosts, and it'll optimize them for Windows 10. It just does everything that you need to make Windows 10 an awesome operating system for Azure Virtual Desktop. It just stops silly things like the Xbox Game Bar and things like that. You know, just things that you don't need in a virtual desktop environment. And you can customize it as you need to. You can pass in parameters and configure JSON files to make it do exactly what you want. So what I'm doing in this particular task is I'm optimizing the operating system for Azure Virtual Desktop. Then I'm doing a restart. So I've got this, this customized processes. These are the steps that I want to do to build my image. And then I'm running a PowerShell command. Yeah, PowerShell. Um, and then I'm installing um, Microsoft Teams. And this is just straight from the Microsoft Docs article, someone's GitHub uh, repository. And this is just a script that installs Microsoft Teams. You'd probably want to host this yourself if you're using your own, but you need it to be public accessible. Uh, and then you run that script and it'll install Microsoft Teams. I'm going to do another reboot after that. And then we're going to install all of the Windows updates. This is another customizer they call these things. Uh, we're going to install up to 40 Windows updates, uh, anything that is in preview um, now, uh, and also anything that isn't installed. <laughs> that seems obvious, but no. Uh, so, and then it'll install the Windows updates, and then automatically it will uh, do a sysprep for you and then shut that operating system down. And then uh, Azure Image Builder will copy that off to a, a gallery, like a shared image gallery, and then you can use that shared image gallery to deploy your um, virtual machines, uh, your um, Azure Virtual Desktops out. Using this, I'll call it a task sequence, but it's customizer, customizers, that's what they're calling it, um, uh, de, you know, deploy those out to um, uh, uh, your virtual machines. Now, I just wanted to quickly show you, I'm jumping around a little bit here, but I just wanted to quickly show you this here. Uh, scroll down here. I see image reference here. Um, this is where I'm saying grab the um, grab the Azure Virtual Desktop image that I've customized. And I, I thought you could put latest in here, but I haven't tested it yet. I just ran out of time. Um, but um, so this this is where I'm saying grab that customized image that I've built with Azure Image Builder and deploy a virtual machine out with that. Um, and I've used uh, in this particular scenario. I'll just jump back to the other template just briefly uh, here. You can see I've used that, they call it Office 365. They haven't updated the name here yet, uh, typical. So this is, <laughs> they change names all over the place except here. Um, so uh, uh, Microsoft Windows Virtual Desktop uh, is the, um, uh, sorry, Microsoft Windows Desktop is the publisher and Office 365 and the latest version with Office 365 installed. Uh, so that's what that is. And then I'm running my customizations on top of that. Uh, so that's all I really wanted to show you there. There's a lot in here, so I, I won't. And I, I saw that someone has requested the um, uh, code as well, so I'll definitely share that code with anyone who wants it. Uh, and that's all I really wanted to show you in the ARM templates. I'll just quickly jump back to the portal, just briefly. 
um because i just I, I know i'm taking quite a lot of time here so please feel free not like, you don't have to stick around i'm not going to feel um <laughs> i'm not going to feel bad if anyone has to take off because i'm taking too long so please you know feel free to take off if you need to but i just wanted to quickly and i've got a, some best practices and stuff that i want to cover after this and then those field notes that i spoke about but i just wanted to quickly show you um the um azure image builder because it's fairly new and it's like I, it's where microsoft is pushing people um, obviously you can build your Im images however you want there's that it resource group um, that they um, create for me thank you microsoft um, but here's the um, azure image builder resource group uh, and in here this is being a little bit hard to read um, but you can see here um, i've got this gallery uh, and then i'll just wait for this to load up and then i've got that image that i've created and um, and then that's where that's created there. And then there's that version number there that Azure Image Builder has created for me. Now, um, you can distribute this with the shared image gallery to any number of reasons. And you might do that for DR purposes. You might drop it in Australia East and Australia Southeast, for example, or Central or something. So that you've got a copy of your base image if you need it. Golden image, base image, whatever you want to call it these days. Uh, so you've got a copy of that image if you need it moving forward. Uh, yeah, so that's all I really wanted to show you in the demo. I'll jump back into some best practices and stuff now. Try not to send anyone to sleep. Um, any questions before I move on? All right, I'll minimize that and that. And then we'll press on. Thanks all for sticking around with me too, by the way. I'm hoping everyone's getting something out of this. Uh, so let's look at some Active Directory best practices. And you're going to hear stuff that you've heard before. So please bear with me here. Um, use, like I said earlier on, use Azure Active Directory domain services if you're a cloud native organization. So if you're born in the cloud, you haven't got on-prem Active Directory, use Azure Active Directory domain services for Azure Virtual Desktop. Otherwise, use Active Directory. Uh, there's no need to have three, three Active Directories. Active Directory, Azure Active Directory, and then Azure Active Directory domain services, that's just unnecessary. But um, if you're born in the cloud and you've only got Azure Active Directory, then go ahead and get Azure Active Directory domain services to support Azure Virtual Desktop. And those names are long. Uh, now, uh, use conditional access for your users. So just control how they get into um, Azure Virtual Desktop. That's the keys to your data. So maybe put on some conditional access there, some multi-factor authentication to protect um, your data, your company's data. Uh, and then use multi-factor authentication for your administrators. They've obviously got a higher level of access, you know, different accounts for your administrators, particularly um, potentially even different machines that they use to access the Azure resources and use multi-factor on their accounts. These are all stuff you've heard before. Now, deploy your domain controllers in the same region as your Azure, um, sorry, as your Azure Virtual Desktop session hosts. And then what you'll typically do is um, create Active Directory sites for your regions at a bare minimum. Um, uh, you know, you might do it per VNet or you might do it per region, but create your Active Directory, traditional Active Directory sites um, for your Azure regions as well. So you'll have domain controllers right next to your Azure Virtual Desktop hosts. So when people log on, there's no delay going across some sort of VPN, VPN connection back to on-prem to contact the domain controller and then back again. So that speeds up that log on time. Uh, and you probably want to deploy two in availability zones for redundancy. Let's move on to best practices for profile management. So uh, just a quick one here that'll catch people out of there. You know, you go ahead and create your storage account. Uh, if you want to domain join your Azure, Act, sorry, if you want to domain join your Azure storage um, file, sir, file share, um, you'll uh, want to keep that name less than 15 characters because that's that net BIOS name limit in Active Directory. Um, so keep it less than 15 so it doesn't get trimmed. Um, that's a good one to remember. Uh, and deploy, this is like, this is a no brainer. But deploy your FS logic storage in the same region as your session host VMs. Like don't deploy it in Australia Southeast and deploy your VMs in Australia East. It doesn't make a lot of sense. But you probably do want to GRS your storage potentially. So consider that definitely. Now, um, I didn't speak about this earlier, but I'll cover it now. Uh, consider splitting. They've got two types of containers in FS logics. They've got office containers, which is for like temporary cached ephemeral data. And then they've got profile containers, which is what I showed you tonight. What you, if you've got a very large deployment or you've got a lot of personal, sorry, you've got a lot of backup requirements, you probably want to split out your office cached te temporary data into a um, into an office container and a separate VHD in a separate storage account and not back that up. But then you probably do apologies. Um, then, but you probably do want to back up your profile containers. Um, 
because that you know that's data that people might care about. You might want to GRS replicate that storage, but you might not care about doing that for your office temporary data. So be aware that there are two types of profile containers. And this is group policy settings that I showed you as well. So delete the local profile when the FS logic profile should apply. Use dynamic VHCs to save storage space. And then, because you're paying for that storage in the Azure storage account for that VHD that's, you know, thick provisioned, as they'd say, um, when you're not using that full amount of gigabytes. So you can save a bit of money there and um, swap those directory name control uh, components. So you get the username first, not the SID first. These are all excellent group policy settings to remember. I don't expect everyone to remember this right now, but when you come to deploy Azure Virtual Desktop, come back and have a look at this and um, you know use these settings to help get that optimal experience for your users. Uh, now some best practices for host pools. Uh, so keep your host pools extremely consistent. Uh, now you don't want them configuring that you want, don't want any microphone apologies. You don't want to get any um, configuration drift, what they call it, for, with your session hosts in the pool. You want to keep them as you want to keep them identical. Every single virtual machine in your host pool should be identical. And that's why I chose desired state configuration to configure PowerShell DSC I'm talking about there to configure my host pools is because it'll bring them back into compliance if they drift. Some um, you know, IT administrator gets on there and does something funky, DSC will just bring that back into compliance. So they all remain consistent. Very important to do this. And you can do this by periodically deploying images to make sure that they stay consistent as well. So that's extremely important. Use the same size VM, Put this. Put the all the VMs for a, for a host pool in the same resource group, and then use the same configuration on every single VM. Now, size your hosts appropriately. So, um, don't use um, instance sizes with less than four virtual CPUs. Uh, Microsoft explains why this is. So, Windows 10 uses two virtual CPUs by default. Uh, one for the operating system and one for the UI or something like that. Uh, so if you do two, then you've got nothing left for your users. Uh, so start with four uh, at minimum and then scale depending on your requirements and Microsoft has guidelines on this. So I won't go into detail on those, but Microsoft has guidelines and then you can monitor your resources to get an idea of whether you've made the right decision or not in a, you know, in a pilot or something like that. You can deploy to 10 users, does it work? Does it scale? Does it perform? that sort of thing, and then size them appropriately as you need to. But don't do less than four CPU, virtual CPUs. Uh, you can uh, deploy your images um, from storage accounts. You can deploy your images from directly from Microsoft. You can deploy them from the shared image gallery that I spoke about, but deploy them from the same region. No matter how you do it, use storage from the same region um, because you're just going to get better performance that way. And I, I'm not even sure it's 100% supported in other in, in some scenarios. I haven't even tried it, to be honest. Like, I haven't put something in Australia Southeast and tried to deploy an image from it to see if it even works. Um, and I'll, just one thing on the host pools as well. Um, it's a good idea to split your host pools up a little bit um, so that you can maintain them. So you'll probably have, like, this rolling upgrade scenario uh, where you'll be you you know you'll have a new image coming out and you want to test that against some users uh, and they've got this is like software testing for anyone who's familiar with this stuff so you might give a small amount of your new session host to users just to sort of test it out with them see if it's okay and then if you don't get any negative feedback back from your users um, then you might cut over to your new host pool and start working on the other one so you might sort of uh, blue green them they call it sometimes um, or you might um, you know a and b test them and then roll you know roll over to one um, it's kind of like deployment slots and, uh, slots and app service. If you've seen that, you sort of flip over to one and then flip back if everything goes wrong. That's kind of like that, but with your host pools, with your VMs. So you'll end up running two lots of VMs for a very short period of time as you flip over, and then you can delete the old ones and, and start re-imaging them to the newest versions of the software. Because you'll end up in this monthly cycle, at least monthly cycle, where you're upgrading Windows and Office and all of the other applications if you're not doing it some, through some other configuration management tool. Um, and you want to be able to move people up to the newer version, but not destroy everyone's environment all at once, because um, you can do a lot of damage to your organization by just cutting everyone over to the new version of Office, and next minute none of your Excel macros work or something like that. Um, so just be aware of that. Uh, and then uh, Microsoft gives you this validation environment. Uh, and it's a checkbox that you can do on your host pool. So that allows you to test Microsoft updates um, to the Azure Virtual Desktop service before it gets made generally available to everyone else. So you can use a small amount of your host in a, in a validation environment to test that out as well. Uh, like I said before, use reservations and auto-scaling. Microsoft has tools to make auto-scaling easier, and it's also very easy to do yourself with PowerShell or something similar. 
Now, I didn't speak about this earlier. I did speak about MSI, app, sorry, MSI X app attach, but I didn't speak about app masking. So FS Logics has this app masking technology that allows you to hide applications from users in their desktops. Uh, you can also use things like App Locker and what is it, Windows Defender, uh, sorry, Microsoft Defender Application Guard as well. Um, but app masking allows you to just hide it. I don't, know, I don't know if anyone has had a problem with the users where if they can see it, they want it. And app masking just hides it. <laughs> so that's with um, FS Logics, that app masking technology. So you can use that. And you can use MSI App Attach to dynamically attach applications. That's one less thing you have to maintain on that rolling image cycle because you can maintain that separately. Um, and with your host pools as well, this is something that, this is something that you're going to spend quite a bit of time on. So do as much automation here as you possibly can. Uh, this is where you're going to burn all your time if you don't spend time automating this stuff. At the very least, have some PowerShell scripts that you run to configure your um, session hosts. Uh, uh, but look at something else if, you, if possible, like Azure Image Builder or something similar. Just look at some um, uh, backup and recovery and monitoring scenarios as well, best practices. So uh, I wouldn't use, uh, I'd use availability zones for pooled virtual desktops. They're available in Australia East. Uh, it allows you to suffer the failure of a data center and then not use or lose all of your Azure virtual desktops. Uh, I wouldn't bother using those with uh, personal virtual desktops. It doesn't really make sense. If you lose that virtual machine, you lose that virtual machine. There's not much you can do about that. Um, but use availability zones for your pooled host pools. Uh, now with backup, um, uh, your personal uh, hosts, you want to back those up using um, those personal ones we spoke about. We want to back those up with um, site recovery or uh, Azure backup because they could have potentially data on that you need. You might not want to back them up. That's a decision you'll need to make, but there's some tools that you can use to back those up if you want to. And with your pooled hosts, uh, you might not back them up at all, uh, or you might have some in a separate region already. Or you might have what they call, and this is an old Exchange server term. I don't know how widely this is used outside of the Exchange team, but um, there's got this thing called a pilot light, which means maybe you want to have like a small amount of Azure virtual desktops for your absolutely mission critical things uh, in another region. And then if everything goes completely belly up in Australia East, where you might be running all your Azure virtual desktops, then you can obviously have the absolute critical parts of your business need to run, run in Australia Southeast, for example. Uh, and uh, consider um, reservations potentially in the secondary region as well. Uh, it's a good way to make sure that you're going to be guaranteed compute in that secondary region if you've paid for it up front. If Australia East is wiped off the face of the planet, you don't want to be the guy who hasn't reserved stuff in Australia Southeast. <laughs> Anyways, uh, replicate your images. Uh, so if you're using a shared image gallery, you can replicate them out to different regions as well. Um, and that's just like a flick of a flick of a switch. You can say, can I make this available in Australia East as well? Oh, sorry, Australia Southeast and Australia East. Again, you geographically replicated um, your uh, golden or base image. Do you have a question there? Who is that with their hand up? I'm trying to find whose name that is. Rez, is it? Did you have a question? Uh, I'll just I'll just move on. Uh, so um, replicate your images, yep. And then uh, you probably want to replicate your profiles, like use GRS storage as well for your profiles potentially as well. Uh, that's up to you and you can back those up as well. Uh, and then um, Azure Monitor has excellent support. Like if you haven't seen this, go and check this out. Uh, Microsoft has excellent Azure Monitor support for Azure Virtual Desktop. It will tell you everything from what you know, the person who's connecting had for breakfast all the way through to which application took to load, you know, how long each application took to load. The monitoring data is amazing. Uh, I cannot stress that enough. Uh, let's look at some security best practice. We'll just power through these because everyone knows security is very important and they're probably already doing all these things. So you don't need a public IP on your Azure virtual desktops and you don't need RDP port 3389 available from the internet. You just don't need it. If the connectivity is reverse connect scenario, it's outbound from the Azure Virtual Desktop, so you don't need public IPs on those on those desktops. Should use uh, BitLocker to encrypt your disks, uh, and use Microsoft Defender to protect your um, uh, Windows Virtual Desktops. Uh, sorry, Azure Virtual Desktops as well. You can get that through Security Center or through Microsoft Endpoint Manager. Uh, I think the support for pooled virtual desktops is either in preview or not available yet. 
um, but it's available for uh, MEM, I mean there, um, but at Microsoft Defender through Security Center or manual configuration is available. Um, use, um, I just, there was one more thing I had there. Um, I've got collector logs here. Um, so obviously collect logs along the way um, of, you know, your audit logs, uh, collect your um, sign-in logs, uh, collect, collect your activity logs in Azure, just log every, I've, I've never, no one's ever come and said to me, Wayne, I wish you'd logged less. No one's ever come and said that to me. They've always come and said to me, do you have the logs for firewall, blah, 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 blah. No, say, yes, we've got that. <laughs> That's what you want to be able to say. Uh, you don't want to be able to say, sorry, I didn't bother to collect those logs. I, I thought you wouldn't want them. Um, because when auditing time comes around or when security breach come time uh, time comes around, you want to be uh, the person who has the logs. Uh, and uh, you can make sure you keep your software up to date. Like it's all there now. It's easy to use. Um, much better, you know, much easier to update there than what it has been um, when it's roaming all over the globe. Um, so keep them up to date and use AppLocker and use application control as well. These are highly recommended things in the security space uh, to keep your Windows um, uh, systems secure. Uh, and then you can control that device redirection. So maybe don't let everyone redirect their drives so they can copy all your network shares out to their home PCs and maybe control clipboard redirection in some scenarios as well. Uh, and potentially some other settings. So check the RDP settings when you configure your host pools and make sure that you've got that redirection set how you want to have it set. And then you can uh, configure idle disconnect as well. You'll definitely want to check these timeouts. Uh, they're configured in uh, group policy, not in Azure. And um, I think uh, exam tip for anyone who's interested as well. And um, configure those because people are working from home, you know, partners, friends, housemates can come up and start logging onto your systems if they're not idly disconnecting while they've gone out for lunch. So just be aware of that as well. Um, now some notes from the field. So these are things that I've learned um, while I've been deploying Azure Virtual Desktop and from years of experience as well in desktop virtualization. Uh, so uh, here's the first one that probably will come as no surprise to everyone that home internet will likely be your biggest user support issue. People think their internet is great until they find out that it's not. <laughs> and Microsoft provides a bunch of tools and people working from home, Netflix streaming, go in the background, kids play on their Xbox. It's crazy. Like their bandwidth is good until everyone's in lockdown. So um, this is going to be your biggest problem. Microsoft provides an experience estimator that allows you to determine, allows people to go to a website and work out what their Windows virtual desktop experience might be like. You may also want to direct them to, you know, speedtest or fast.com or something like that. Um, and then um, uh, and then you can monitor that connection via that Wi-Fi looking icon I spoke about at the top as well. And Azure Monitor obviously collects a lot of data as well. Aim for a response time less than 200 milliseconds for your end users. Now that sounds crazy. 200 milliseconds is a lot. That, like, that's like here to the US. Um, but that's like the top. And I've noticed people really start to complain when you hit that 200 milliseconds. But really you want to make sure you're under 100. You could go somewhere in between as well if you absolutely have to. But for the absolute best experience, you want to keep it as low as possible. So 200 milliseconds is like the, this is not going to work, guys. And then 100 milliseconds is like, this is going to be fine. And anything less than that is just great. Uh, so, And I just want one more thing quickly before I move on. RDP Short Path is a new piece of technology that's coming out from Microsoft. It allows you to get even lower response times by allowing direct private network connectivity. So if you've got a head office and it's connected via express route to Azure, and you've got an extremely high performing connection there, you can do a private connection to your Azure virtual desktop as well using this technology called RDP short path that will give you even lower response times than that 22 milliseconds that we saw uh, tonight. So definitely check RDP short path out as well. Maintaining your images and your software and your host will consume most of your time. This is the thing that I found out as well. And that's where I talk about that uh, green, uh, green, blue, uh, AB stuff. Um, you'll want to uh, automate as much of this as you possibly can. Automate, 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 script, 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 configuration management, as much of this as you possibly can, because this is where you're going to spend all of your time. So Microsoft Office, Teams, and OneDrive all have special configurations for Azure Virtual Desktop that you need to deploy in a multi-session environment. And Microsoft Teams has the Web RTC component uh, built in um, to, oh, sorry, it has, it's built into the client, so the end user, 
um, but it's not built into the um, server side. Uh, so there's an additional component that you need to install on your Azure virtual desktops to give that perfect Microsoft Teams video call experience inside their Azure virtual desktop, not outside, uh, which is really nice. Uh, big one here, don't rule out Windows Server as an option for deploying Azure virtual desktop. RD, remote desktop services CALs are extremely cost effective and um, they are potentially the most cost effective way to deploy Azure Virtual Desktop if you don't have E3, E5, e, you know, uh, sorry, F3, etc. Uh, be aware of the plethora of Azure limits that are uh, available to you. Uh, so uh, just to give you a couple, uh, so um, an FSLogix file share, like a standard uh, general purpose v2 file share, can support about uh, 20 simultaneous logons from a, from a performance perspective with FS Logics, that's a really low number, so it's worth being aware of. Um, but you can enable what's called large file support on the storage account, and that'll give you four, like performance up to 4,000 users. So there's a, an option there to get out of that. And then you've obviously got premium storage as well, premium file shares, and then you've got um, NetApp files as well for even faster storage. So you can scale that up if you need to. Also be aware of just VM subscription and region limits and all that sort of stuff. I actually um, had an experience where I was deploying to the UK, and I actually asked Microsoft for more VMs. Like I said, can I please have some more of this particular VM SKU? And they said, sorry, we don't have any capacity for that. I went, I went wait, what? <laughs> Aren't you the public cloud? <laughs> um, and, then, and then I sort of, sort of said, we like desperately need this. And then they they gave me the compute. So it must have been there, but I, I don't really know what happened there. But I freaked out for a second. I went, oh my God, I cannot actually roll out to the rest of my users. <laughs> so um, be aware of limits. There are limits. They do exist. And limits within your subscription, limits within your resource groups, limits um, on sizes and all that sort of stuff. Now, also just be aware of the client limits for people who connect in. So um, Windows endpoints are the only ones that support those awesome Teams optimizations I spoke about. So you can just take your video calls on your Azure virtual desktop. And I've done this. This works great. Um, but Windows is the only endpoint that supports it. So people on their iPad that I spoke about earlier or on their Mac, they won't be able to use that awesome Teams optimization stuff. Uh, and um, only um, Windows and Mac OS support multi-monitor. Now, I don't, I don't know if anyone's aware, but the newer iPads have um, USB-C. And you could plug in a bunch of monitors into that, but this is not supported, obviously, um, with Azure Virtual Desktop on an iPad. It is supported on Mac OS and Windows. Uh, that's it for me. Uh, any questions or comments? Oh my God, everyone's, everyone's gone to sleep. The entire room. I think you explained everything so thoroughly uh, <laughs> that nobody has any questions. Oh, there might be a, oh, there might be a question there. I think we might have uh, one. Rez, Rez has got his hand up. <laughs> no, just saying. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Much. Sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, uh, I've got a question regarding um, connecting the on-prem uh, Active Directory. So I'm assuming we need a VPN connection to Azure. What's yeah. the What's the best practice to having a VPN connection? Is it to our uh, uh, RAS server or any particular device that you can suggest? This this really depends on what you have at the moment. So if you have a, a firewall, um, you know, some sort of router or VPN appliance at your gateway at your branch or head office, um, you probably want to use that. And then um, you can either deploy the same brand if they've got a, a virtual appliance in the marketplace on Azure. You can deploy the same one in Azure <clears throat> and then create that VPN connection if you want to maintain that brand um, you know, that support, uh, or you can deploy a VPN gateway in Azure and connect from your router there, or like alternative, alternatively, like you said, you can um, uh, connect uh, routing and remote access. This is like bare bones, routing and remote access, Windows Server on-prem to, um, uh, uh, or even open SSL VPN or something like that to a VPN gateway in Azure. And obviously there's also Express Route as well. There's a few options there. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Is it Bert? I'm going to say Bert. I'm going to shorten your name if that's okay. <laughs> Bert is yes. Um, when you built your image, you went out to some GitHub um, locations. And you said those need to be public accessible. Um, wouldn't that allow for a um, attack? Uh, um, uh, you know, 
to introduce bugs into your into your um, images? Yeah, I, I would suggest you, suggest you definitely host these um, yourself and not just use someone else's code. I did I did that. I was being lazy. Let's be honest. Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah. It's, a, it's just. A... Um, but definitely host them yourself and potentially even put them on Azure Storage and use things like shared access keys and stuff like that to get access to them, so they're not even publicly accessible. You're actually accessing them um, securely. So maybe, um, okay. yeah, Fair maybe enough. go down that path. They publicly accessible by means of a or some sort of authentication, I guess. Yeah. Sure. Um, would you consider building your infrastructure with Bisec? Obviously, you've put a lot of work into the into the ARM templates. Definitely, yes. <laughs> the next version will probably be in Bisec. <laughs> cool. For sure. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Or any other questions from you, Bettis, as well? No, I'm fine from you, thanks. No problem. Wow, that was uh, an, an incredibly uh, thorough session. So thank you, uh, Wayne. That, that is absolutely awesome. No problem. Thanks for having me. Definitely learned a lot about from that. And, um, you know, as, as everyone who's been a member of this group for a while knows that we always appreciate our speakers and the time that the, that you volunteer to pre prepare all of this material and, and present it to us. So if this was a um, if this was a live meeting, maybe I'd be handing you a bottle, but I don't see any reason to let uh, to let uh, virtual uh, events when stop that. Oh, so yeah. Yeah. cheers. Thank you. Wait, what? <laughs> This is, what, is this, what is this nonsense? Is this dry July or something? Never I can't have this. Man. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I'm going to deal with Azure, I'm going to need something harder than a Pepsi Max. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, I know why. It's because it's dry July. So oh, that is it. <laughs> that is it. Not okay. That must be what it is. Okay. <laughs> no, seriously, that uh, fantastic job, Wayne. That's that's awesome. Thank you so much uh, for, for giving all that time and, and effort in this. No problem at all. Uh, so for everyone who's still attending, um, uh, this has been recorded, this session, and um, and just give me a few days, probably until the weekend, actually, for me to get the uh, recording downloaded and then updated to uploaded to our YouTube site. So keep an eye out on the meetup uh, for this event. In the comments, I'll put in the link uh, for the recording. And we also usually upload the slides, for the ones that Damien showed at the beginning. Uh, those will go up as well. And I don't know if you want to share your slides, Wayne, or not somewhere, but you're welcome to. Yeah, I'll uh, do that as well. Buy a link somewhere, and uh, yeah, if people want to access that uh, that deck, that would be you know phenomenal. Yeah, no problem. Um, great. So with that, uh, I think we'll probably call it a night. Uh, do check in uh, with us next month, where we've got Todd Whitehead, who's going to talk to us about. Let me just find the. Uh, the details again, we've got a great session on Azure Arc and, and pads, which is a really great subject. So um, I know I'm, I'm really looking, uh, looking forward to that. So I hope to see you, uh, see you all back in August. And thanks again, Wayne, for everything. And uh, have a good night, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>